is for every Filipino who has ever been unjustly accused. We begin with the big news out of the Philippines with ties to Hawaii. Journalist Maria Ressa, who we have talked about extensively here on This Is Now, is cleared of tax evasion by a Philippines court. <laughs> Maria Ressa is a Nobel Peace Prize winner who runs the news site Rappler in the Philippines. She hailed the verdict as a victory for justice and the truth. Today, facts win. Ressa and her news organization earned a reputation for its in-depth reporting and tough scrutiny of the former president Rodrigo Duterte and his deadly war on drugs. I think, you know, as a joke, people were saying, I, I think Rappler has PTSD. We do, but we will continue to hold the line. The Philippine government had accused Ressa and Rappler of evading tax payments when it raised funds through its partnership with foreign investors. Democracy next. Rappler's business license was revoked back in 2018 after allegedly violating the Philippine Constitution's ban on foreign ownership of Philippine media, all because of a Hawaii relationship. You see, back in 2015, Honolulu Civil Beat publisher and eBay founder Pierre Omidyar invested in Rappler. Um, these charges, as you know, were politically motivated, they were incredible to us. A brazen abuse of power. Cell phone, cell phone. And meant to stop journalists from doing their jobs. But, give me two seconds. These cases are where capital markets, where rule of law, where press freedom meet, right? So this acquittal by is not just for Rappler. It is for every Filipino who has ever been unjustly accused. Oh, Ressa and Rappler have also been very critical of the new president, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos, namesake of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr., Hawaii News Now has done extensive reporting on the Marcos family's ties to Hawaii. You can watch a complete documentary that was just published last year on our H&N digital platforms right now. It's called The Amelda Tapes. Ron Menor, a longtime Hawaii politician who brought decades of passionate service to elected seats in the legislature and Honolulu City Council, has died at the age of 67. Governor Josh Green announced the news yesterday evening, saying that Menor died a day earlier following an unexpected medical emergency. Menor was the son of the late Hawaii Supreme Court Justice Benjamin Menor and Lillian Menor, and his career spanned decades in office. We're gonna miss. We're gonna miss Ron. He did serve in the House um, previously, and the guy was this. He was a gentleman. He was intelligent, and we're gonna miss him. Menor is survived by his wife Patricia and sons Benjamin, Andrew, and Anthony. And for the latest on Capitol Hill, joining us right now is Hawaii News Now White House correspondent John Decker. John, always a great time talking with you. Now, uh, first off, the House Oversight Committee released a statement on the uh, President Biden classified document scandal. Uh, what does it say? Well, the House Oversight Committee, Mark, is taking the lead in terms of investigating this matter involving these classified documents found at the personal residence of Joe Biden and as well as an office that he used prior to becoming president. The chair of the committee, James Comer of Kentucky, has sent a letter to the University of Pennsylvania to the president at Penn and what he's asking for and what he's requesting from Penn to provide to the committee visitors logs associated with the think tank that was established by Penn uh, called the Penn Biden Center after Joe Biden left office. In addition to those visitors logs, uh, the congressman also wants to uh, indicate to the committee where this think tank established by Penn got their funding, what foreign sources funded this think tank, uh, even including China. So that is something that uh, Penn is being asked for by the House Oversight Committee. No response yet uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. I'm sure that they will cooperate fully. But you get a sense, Mark, that this is the first focus of 
the chairman's uh, investigation into these classified documents found in the possession of Joe Biden. Yeah, and it feels as if there are so many different tentacles to all of this. Now, uh, could this investigation and the Department of Justice probe influence Biden's decision to run for re-election? I think absolutely. Certainly the timing of an announcement from President Biden that he's running for another four-year term is impacted by this. Uh, so whereas at the very beginning of the year before this issue was on anybody's radar, I think the thinking was that uh, Joe Biden could announce that he's running again for president in a matter of weeks or maybe a matter of the first quarter of 2024. I think that timetable's now been put off because of these dual track investigations, one being conducted at the Department of Justice by the special counsel, the other being conducted by the House Oversight Committee. Uh, there are even some Mark here in Washington, who question whether Joe Biden will even run for re-election in 2024, given the dark cloud that's now hanging over him and this White House. Now, finally, John, you were in the Oval Office yesterday uh, and asked President Biden uh, about the classified documents. What did you ask and how did he respond? Well, that's right, Mark. I was in the Oval Office because President Biden was meeting with his counterpart, the prime minister from the Netherlands, at the end of uh, the statements that each of them read, it was an opportunity for me and the other reporters in the Oval Office to ask questions of President Biden. Uh, I focused my question uh, focusing on an interview that Joe Biden gave on 60 Minutes back in mid-September in which he chided his predecessor, former President Donald Trump, for having in his possession classified documents at the time in that interview. He called it irresponsible. And my question to President Biden was, was it irresponsible of you to have classified documents in your possession? No response from Joe Biden. He looked over, smiled at me, but I think he's under strict orders from the White House Counsel's Office not to respond to questions in regards to these ongoing investigations. As always, and with so many things in Washington, stay tuned. Hawaii News Now White House correspondent John Decker, thank you so much. Have a great one. So while the U.S. population is showing signs of growth, China's is actually declining for the first time in 60 years. Let's turn things over now to Tina Krause with more on the implications of that. Three-year-old Yan Li gets all his toys to himself as an only child living with his parents in Shanghai. His mother says it's unlikely we'll consider having a second child, and it's not government policy putting me off. I just have high career goals. China's population has fallen for the first time in six decades, with the national birth rate hitting a record low at 6.77 births per 1,000 people. China threw out its controversial one-child policy in 2016, allowing married couples to have two children. Still, many families decided not to. The government tried to boost the falling birth rate with tax breaks and improved maternal health care. But last year, China's population dropped by about 850,000. <laughs> India is expected to overtake China this year as the world's most populous country. In the capital, New Delhi, the Khan family is celebrating the birth of their second child, a baby boy. I feel great about it. Always wanted to have one of each. Experts worry China's declining population could impact the global economy. It produces so many goods that a shrinking workforce there could lead to price hikes in the U.S. and worldwide. <laughs> Little Yan's parents say all they're concerned about is giving their only son the best life they can. Tina Krause, CBS News. All right, back out here live in the H&N Digital Center was hungry at this lunch break because Mother Always. Nature is serving up a yuck sandwich, really, because you see that blue sky on top and that beautiful city below. What's in between that layer of just gross brown bog? We don't like that stuff. But could that be changing? We got to get an update from our guy, Hoggy. He has the first alert. Now, those winds will remain light for the next several days, uh, although the winds are expected to get a little bit stronger when that front approaches sometime Friday afternoon. Notice those yellow streamlines, and we're talking about some corner winds, so that means the fog and the haze, as well as the lousy ocean conditions coming about that time for South Shores. And then, starting on Sunday, 
a weak trade wind breeze starts to move in, and that's going to be the case for the better part of next week, it looks like, at least for the first few days of next week. So for the Kona side, they're not going to see much in the way of change. They'll still get those hazy skies with afternoon clouds and a few spotty showers. And for the Hilo side, they'll likely see more rain from that front as it leaves. So it's going to be a little bit damp on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Well, shopping at the supermarket has become an increasingly stressful experience with prices rising from inflation. And we're all wondering when relief could be on the way. With more on that, we're joined by Karen Kafo. Karen, thank you so much for talking with us. Now, first off, uh, when we look at the overall producer price index report, uh, what goods and services are we talking about? And what other news can we take from today's numbers? Yeah, well, Mark, we're looking at a variety of goods and services across the United States. We're talking about everything from the groceries on the store shelves to the price of fuel. Also, services related to those things like warehousing and transportation. So a number of things that this report from the Labor Department gauges. And so when we looked at the producer price index, we're talking about, if you look at those grocery store items, wholesale prices. So that is what these businesses, grocery stores, supermarkets are paying so they can put those items on the shelf for you. Of course, the consumer price index is something a little bit different. That's what you pay when you go to the grocery store. But a lot of economists look at the PPI, the producer price index, and see it as a indicator that kind of leads to what consumers might see down the line. So if it costs less for the supermarket to put your favorite cereal on the shelf, maybe they can ease up the prices to you, the consumer. So what we saw from this morning's report is that inflation across the board, really, when it came to these wholesale prices, was down a little bit. And that's a good thing. Think Things moving in the right direction. Now, don't get me wrong, things are still high. Those prices are still going to be high when you're at the grocery store. But again, the rate at which they are increasing seem to slow a little bit month to month, Mark. Now, overall, food prices remain high uh, and consumers will still feel that. Uh, but which products have had the steepest increases and, and what is the best explanation for that? Yeah, the things that everybody is talking about include eggs, especially if you look at the uh, increase, uh, according to the PPI, up 192% year over year. And anyone who's tried to buy a dozen eggs recently has really felt that. It's been absolutely striking. That has to do with the avian flu outbreak here in the United States and how that has impacted how uh, eggs are able to get to the grocery store shelves. The other thing that we are seeing big increases on, fresh vegetables nearly doubled uh, over the the last year or so. That has to do with drought conditions in a lot of the states that produce a lot of our produce, California, for example. And now with those storms that California just experienced in other western states, we're going to see another ripple effect from that with the impact of that. So vegetables as well. And grains. We started to see pressure on grain prices after the war in Ukraine started, after Russia uh, started that war in Ukraine, because Ukraine is such a big grain producer for Europe and other parts of the globe. It's considered the breadbasket of that region. And so that put pressure on prices globally. So a number of staples that we put in our grocery baskets every week have seen those kinds of pressures. And of course, there's been the overall price pressures across the board. Uh, this all started with the pandemic in 2020. We saw a huge uptick starting in April of 2020 as consumers started to buy more goods and services as the pandemic started to go on. So this is something that we are still seeing the fallout from. But hopefully economists are looking at this producer price index number the consumer price index number that came out last week and saying we might be turning a corner here. Yeah, yeah, about that. So what, what are kind of the long-term forecasts and the prognostications that we can kind of look at here when folding in both reports? Well, if you look at both of these things, often when the Labor Department presents these statistics, they strip out food and fuel prices because those tend to be very volatile. So, for example, the producer price index for December, that reading was actually pushed downward overall because there was a decline in fuel prices. I don't know what kinds of numbers you are seeing in Hawaii right now, but here in the mainland United States, there has been a downward trend in fuel prices. And that, of course, is subject to change at any time. There's a certain volatility with that. Same thing with food prices. Like I I said with uh, produce, for example, and how something like weather can blow in and really interrupt the supply chain there. So a little bit of volatility. But when economists look at this overall number and have been looking at the trends over the last few months or so, there seems to be a moving downward in terms of how quickly prices have been rising. Some seem to think that that inflation pressure peaked maybe in the spring of 2022 and we could be headed in the right direction. Of course, the Federal Reserve has something to do with that. Their goal was to hike 
interest rates, so it became a little bit more expensive for consumers to borrow money, so maybe they wouldn't spend as much. And so when there's less demand, there's less pressure on supply. And so that tends to even things out. The Federal Reserve's trick, though, is to make sure that they don't slow consumer spending too much and put the U.S. into a recession. That's going to be the next thing that they are gauging. Now that they've seen this kind of progress on the inflation front, they're going to try to keep a steady hand, Mark. Just a complex equation all around. Uh, Hawaii gas prices, numbers came out today. The average is still uh, is less than $5 a gallon, but still higher than national numbers. So, uh, yeah, it's all relative, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Karen Kafa, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Well, there's new concerns that AI is helping students cheat. With more on that, Steve was joined by a special guest today on Sunrise. There's a controversial new online writing tool called ChatGPT. With its vast AI knowledge, it can write a paragraph, even a full-length paper on pretty much any topic that you ask it to. Ryan Ozawa is a local tech expert and the uh, uh, Pacific News editor for Decrypt. Uh, first off, why was this even created, Ryan? Well, artificial intelligence has been under development for decades. And in fact, when you're dealing with your digital assistant, you're talking to your watch, or you're dictating to your phone, there's right. AI there. And even in the area of writing, it's been writing articles about baseball games just based on the box scores. It can write about stocks without any humans being involved. So AI has been in our day-to-day -day lives even when we don't know it. Okay, so you went online, you tried this out. Yes. What was your experience like? Well, you're thinking, well, sure, it's, it's pretty smart. It probably can explain to me the Declaration of Independence, right. but how much nuance can it pick up on things? So I asked it, you know, can you define for me the word aloha. Ah. And I was thinking I was maybe going to get the Don Ho definition or something like that. And it turned out to be pretty remarkable in terms of its response. It says that the word aloha is a Hawaiian word. It has multiple meanings depending on context. It can mean hello and goodbye. Sure, most people know that, but it talks about love and affection, peace and compassion, gratitude. And you can even say after it gives you the answer, Tell me a little bit more. Right, and it which is what you just did. That's what we're right, exactly. Right yeah. And so it talks about Hawaiian culture, and as a greeting, it can be hello or goodbye. That's a repeat, so that's how you can sort of know AI is involved. But it then goes into comparing it to Namaste in India or Shalom wow. in Hebrew. So it's pretty nuanced. So it's basically building its corpus of knowledge from the entire internet. It sucks as much of it in, and it can generate these responses, which are original every time you ask and, it. And you you didn't speed this up. You sent us this video. Is This is in real time? Is yep. this how and in fact, I believe it? that this is the processing it's doing on the spot. Wow. So you can see that a lot of people are concerned. Well, certainly journalists yeah. such as us are yeah. concerned. But no a lot of people are talking about its applications in schools. OK, and so let's get to that. So if it shuts down, ChatGPT shuts down today, something else is going to pop up tomorrow instantly. So how yes. do schools deal with this? So a lot of people say that this is the end of the essay, yeah. but it's not the end of education. And I think that we've been seeing this trend in our more progressive schools about uh, project-based learning, so they have to demonstrate or build something. Or just basically, instead of writing a paper, you're going to have to go up in front of class talk about your topic and then deal with questions about the topic. I mean, you have to demonstrate your personal mastery of it in a way that doesn't involve writing. Yeah, and I guess Guy had mentioned it too. I guess you want the kids to embrace the technology and, and kind of have access to it and know how to use it. Right. So uh, it's it's one of those double-edged swords where it's it's like, hey, you, you have to experience it for Well, time. there are many companies working on this. They're building it into email. They're building it into writing tools. So eventually, it'll almost be there just like Clippy in the 1990s yeah. for Microsoft Word, but actually good. Yeah. So yeah, I think that keeping letting kids have access to it so they can demonstrate mastery beyond what a robot can do is really the way to go. And you had one more example you wanted to show us, right? Yeah, so I thought, well, that'd be kind of interesting. You can have it write a program, you can have it, uh, it can actually run it, write an application that runs code and stuff. So I said, well, why don't you write a poem for us to close out the segment? So why don't you tell me about the reporters of Hawaii News Now and the Sunrise Crew? So let's go. With voices smooth as tropical seas and looks that make the camera freeze, <laughs> the anchors of Hawaii News Now bring us the stories fresh and true. And it just keeps going like that. You can ask for it in Shakespearean dialogue. You can ask for it in uh, iambic pentameter. Like, it's pretty impressive. So I have now written a theme song, I think, for Hawaii News Now and uh, Sunrise. Yeah, OK, so no one is safe. Uh, journalists, reporters, <laughs> songwriters, poets, we're all over, man. But uh, Ryan, thanks for the time. We appreciate Probably it. Always a pleasure. Excellent. 
crazy stuff. There. And such a wonderful poem. You know, it's something that really should be archived right there to have, have something I thought in place. it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It was very nice. Yeah. And a robot did it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Scary. Let's move on to some other things that the internet is talking about. And it, this is one of them. We love Dolly News here, and we talked about earlier the baking sets that she has set up. Well, she got with some new ones. So earlier it was cake mixes. Now it's brownie flavors are out. Caramel, turtle, and fabulously fudgy. She also has a buttermilk biscuit and a sweet cornbread mix. That buttermilk biscuit sounds really good. Delightful. Yes, this is a collaboration with Duncan Hines. And she's really going back to her southern roots here. As you can see, the creations, the new ones, hit stores shelves next week. There's Yum. nothing like a beautifully thick brownie and then also just a wonderful cornbread that has the perfect amount of sweetness. Oh, I'm very hungry right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And biscuits and gravy, one of my all-time favorite foods, not just at breakfast. I'll eat it any time. So maybe those would be good ones. It must be hard living in Hawaii then, hard to find biscuits and you gravy. You know, there's some options out there, and that's one of the few things I can make. I'm not a chef, but I could do that. Good to know. Let's see it. Now, uh, let's get to some good news now from the, the world of Hawaii high school basketball. See if we can do a, a yeah, we a can replay, replay that, that because I think my graphic do, do was something on the fly. Sorry, guys. There, there we go. go. Yeah, there we go. Oh, that is so fantastic. Now, that is why Lua senior rider me and making the crowd go wild. The 17 year old with autism made a layup in the final seconds of the Bulldogs game against White and I last week. Ryder practices every day with the team, but this is the first time he played in a game, uh, and he's already getting ready for his next big moment. Try to work on my shooting, try to run more, and try to keep it a more closer game. He's a great kid. It, it was pretty awesome. And to see, you know, the Waianae kids helping him out too, you know, that, that was really great. And although Waianae ended up winning, uh, there may be another opportunity for Ryder to get more playing time. Uh, the Bulldogs have two more games, and if they win both, they'll have the top seed in the playoffs. So, uh, I mean, seeing stories like that, it's always so awesome, and um, it just, I mean, it, it's a testament to the power of sports. Yeah, we have a complete story written up about this story on our H&N digital platform, so check it out there if you want to hear more about it. Mm -hmm, love to see it. All right, we have time for a little bit more food news, I believe. It's a special day. For That's right. Ducks. Happy National Peking Duck Day. <laughs> uh, it's known as China's Yum. national dish and goes back thousands of years to the Yuan Dynasty. Now, some fun facts about the duck. Takes 48 hours to prepare. There are three popular forms. Of course, the uh, the crispy skin, uh, which is a classic. And then you have the meat served inside buns with a plum sauce. Just, uh, you know, Yes. Mouth watering. Yes. Yes. And also a duck broth. So that's full of flavor right there. So, uh, hey, an option for uh, for lunch or dinner tonight. Yeah, that looks delicious. <laughs> I love this. All right. That's going to do it for This Is Now on this halfway through the work week. Aloha Wednesday. Yep. Mark's going to be back with you at first at four. So get all the news updates throughout the day. So much going on in h and Digital, by the way. Podcasting all the Time. If you want to find them, listen to them, just go to wherever you find those podcasts. Search who, what you news now. You're going to see all sorts of options from Stephanie Lum, from Lynn Quano. And hey, even This Is Now has a podcast. Even First of Four has a podcast. So listen to us now. Have a good day. Bye-bye.